Welcome everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here for this great panel on a really important topic. My name is Elizabeth Cannon. I'm President Emerita of the University of Calgary based here in Calgary, Alberta. The topic of our session this morning is the role of research and infrastructure in building a sustainable world. We know that the last year uh, has really been about global challenges with the pandemic. But we're seeing more global challenges emerging to ensure that we have a sustainable future, be it economic, environmental, and social aspects of sustainability. The role of research and research infrastructure in meeting these global challenges is paramount. We have a panel that is multidisciplinary to bring their views and to answer questions on this topic. And I know it will be uh, extremely fruitful and stimulating. I'm joined on the panel by Dr. Jan Ruschak, Chair, European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. Dr. Edith Hur, Director General, European Molecular Biological Laboratory and Dr. Yuba Sakona, Vice Chair of the IPCC and former Executive Secretary of the Sahara and the Sahel Observatory. Welcome to our panelists. It's great to have you here this morning. We're going to open up by each of our panelists uh, giving us their views on the contribution of research infrastructure in fostering a more sustainable future. We're going to start with Dr. Ruschak, followed by Dr. Hurd, and Dr. Sakona. So let's get started, after which we'll follow with some Q&A. So over to you, Dr. Frusha. Welcome. Dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to represent in this panel the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. Since its establishment almost 20 years ago, S3, as an intergovernmental organization, advises the Council of European research ministers and the European Commission on uh, research infrastructure related issues. Uh, the joint effort of the member states, the associated countries and the European Commission has radically transformed their landscape of research infrastructures in Europe. And we proudly look back to 55 years, uh, 55 projects and landmarks on our, our roadmap. These research infrastructures uh, of pan-European relevance are worth almost 20 billions of euros joint investment and are serving research communities around the globe. While providing an effective mechanism to identify new investment priorities, ESFRI's ambition goes well beyond uh, coordinating those investments. So uh, ESFRI wants to aim at policy advice in several areas, including sustainability of research infrastructures. We aim to contribute to further facilitate high quality cross-disciplinary research as a prerequisite of sustainability. We, we advocate data interoperability uh, as an important instrument to tackle societal challenges and contribute to sustainability development goals. We are aiming at creating a interconnected research infrastructure ecosystem capable to respond to emerging threats globally and to strengthen the societal readiness and resilience at large. We are fostering synergies between the different European, national and other funding sources and related strategies to maximize the impact and global outreach of the research infrastructures. So, so uh, S3 is a very policy-oriented uh, gathering. And uh, very recently, we have uh, resembled our strategic vision in a policy paper called Making Sense Happen, which sets a new perspective, new ambition for research infrastructures mainly in the European research area. However, uh, this paper conveys so many messages that can be generalized and used by others around the globe. And I would like to highlight only, only one. The main message conveyed by the, this white paper 
which was uh, developed well before COVID, but proven to be right by the pandemic is that a healthy, sustainable, interconnected, interoperable research infrastructure ecosystem that strives for scientific excellence with impact and increases the state of readiness is a prerequisite for sustainable economic growth, for competitiveness of our economies, for regional development and broad societal welfare. This integrated research infrastructure ecosystem, including proper governance and interoperability framework, is the best prevention for any future crisis scenarios. This is from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, over to you, Dr. Hurd. Thank you. Thank you so much. It it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank you, Elizabeth, for the introductions and for moderating this panel. And my thanks also to Innovation Canada and the EU Commission for organizing this great conference um, and for having me. I'm really um, happy to be speaking at ICRI as the Director General of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Um, and I'd like to stress that this event is really a very important forum to discuss research infrastructure prior priorities. It's very timely as well, because on the one hand, support for research infrastructures is not increasing as rapidly as we'd like to see. But on the other hand, we really have to rely on them even more heavily than before, given these, this time of crisis. So I just want to say a few words about EMBL. Um, so this is Europe's only intergovernmental laboratory for the life sciences. We were established in 1974 and we're supported by over 27 member states. And we're located at six sites across Europe in Barcelona, Cambridge, Grenoble, Hamburg and Rome with our headquarters um, here in Heidelberg. Across our sites, our research spans all aspects of molecular biology from structural biology and bioinformatics right through to neurobiology and disease modeling. Alongside our mission to perform high quality fundamental research we also develop and offer vital services to scientists in our member states. We train scientists and students and visitors at all levels, and we actively engage in innovation and translation. And also we provide an integrated approach to European life sciences. I just want to say a word about our service mission because all of our sites have an important service role. EMBL provides structural biology infrastructure for biologists from all over Europe at the ESRF in Grenoble and at the DAISY campus in Hamburg. We enable access to many uh, of the most cutting edge technologies via our experimental services and core facilities. And at EMBL EBI, which is in Cambridge or near Cambridge, this hosts the world's largest biological data resources, making it freely and openly available to everyone. So these research infrastructures are of absolutely vital importance to the scientific research that we and other scientists around the world do. And it's been particularly apparent during the pandemic as we repurposed most of our facilities to contribute to the fight against this virus. And we also collaborated with the EU Commission to set up the COVID-19 data portal that in, 19, uh, that in 2020 recorded over 3.6 million web requests by users from more than 175 geographical locations. So today's pandemic has really highlighted the need for long-term sustainable support to fundamental research, to open science and to research infrastructures that host scientists across Europe and around the world. So fundamental science with support from industry has been absolutely key to allowing the rapid development of vaccines and the therapeutics that we're using during this crisis. It's also our best line of defense for the challenges of the future, both known and unknown. And we know that there are going to be challenges tomorrow. Indeed, the pandemic has really brought home the need to understand life in all its forms in order to protect not only our own health, but that of our planet. And so to rise up to these global challenges and to find new solutions, EMBL is launching a five-year plan called Molecules to Ecosystems, which starts in 2022, and where we're hoping to build up on our existing and globally recognized expertise in molecular biology and reach out to new scientific areas such as ecology, epidemiology, areas that are relevant to microbial and human ecosystems, as well as infection and what we call planetary biology. And in doing this, EMBL will prevent or prepare to fight global challenges at the molecular level. And just to illustrate this very briefly with four practical examples, 
climate change, you know, researching ecosystems at the molecular level can really help to develop and scale up carbon fixation solutions. And work is already ongoing at EMBL to understand natural ways of fixing carbon using algae, for example, that we can already find in our oceans. The second example is biodiversity. Researching whole animals can actually guide the solutions to, re to reverse the impact of biodiversity collapse that we're seeing. EMBL is actually looking into how marine animals such as sea anemones are actually affected by physical environmental changes and what happens when those environments are disturbed, mainly by man. Disease. Most disease is dependent on the environment. So to research cancer, infection and microbiomes, we, we are actually looking into what happens in bodies using models, but also using human data sets, where we're exposed to different environmental insults or the impact that some of the drugs that we take can have. So it's only through an, an advancement of this kind of understanding that we can actually move towards personalized medicine and data-driven solutions. And EMBL really hopes to improve the diagnoses and develop better therapies that build on a rich body of ongoing work. Last but not least, antimicrobial resistance. EMBL scientists are trying to develop new strategies to combat the spread of multidrug resistant pathogens that we're facing. This is going to be the next killer. In 10 or 20 years from now, we will no longer be able to treat um, pathogens that hit us. And there are fewer and fewer antibiotics being developed by companies. So we need to come up with solutions that prevent this spread. So in preparing to launch this new program, we also recognize that EMBL, like all large research institutions, has three key responsibilities when it comes to sustainability. First, we have to perform research in an environmentally responsible way. Second, we can do research that is relevant to the issues that are facing us while still being fundamental. We have a duty to do this. Third, we have to speak up and promote sustainable science. And so to these ends, we're developing an environmental sustainability strategy, which will aim to drive down our carbon footprint, reduce the waste we generate, and ensure that the research that we do in, this area, in these areas is actually supported. And we'll, we want to share our journey and encourage others to join us. We need to lead by example, not just through the research we do, but also the way we do it, our practices. So in conclusion, research infrastructures such as EMBL and the experimental and data services that we provide fuel a virtuous cycle of research, service and technology development. And we also bring together scientific expertise across disciplines that really drive the way to discoveries that we need to address both current and future challenges. Research infrastructures are the drivers of innovation. They help to develop the most advanced instruments and cutting edge technologies, often in close collaboration with industry. And I really want to insist on the fact that it's through collaboration between established organizations that we can really ensure open science and that that becomes the new normal. And last but not least, our community trains and nurtures the next generation of scientists who, of course, are the most critical seeds of future success. Without them, there can be no future. So with all of this in mind, I really look forward to the panel discussion and I thank you so much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Edith. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Sakona. You're on mute. Sorry. Thank you. I'm delighted and I'm honored to be part of this conversation on a very important issue and topic in uh, this uh, pandemic uh, situation. I think that the best way to very well understand and then to see how to deal with that issue is to look at the IPCC, what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is doing. Because IPCC is dealing with climate change is a global problem. And then that require uh, a global, uh, that requires science, it also requires a global participation. It's a global common goods problem issues. IPCC, as it has been clearly set up, ha has to assess on a comprehensive, uh, objective, and a transparent, open and transparent basis, the scientific, technical, socioeconomic, and uh, all information related to understanding the scientific basis for climate risk of uh, human induced and that uh, on climate change, uh, that is uh, a potential impact and option to adapt and to mitigate on climate change uh, aspect. And this has to be done, it should be in a 
a much more transparent basis. And then without uh, any policy consideration, it has to be neutral. And even if the product of IPCC informing the policy. This is very important to understand. And then each of the IPCC reports, since it has been set up, address different issues, inform policy aspects related to sustainability. And then the first report of IPCC has been instrumental to the establishment of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then the second report of IPCC clearly lead to the Kyoto Protocol that was an instrument of the Climate Convention in a continuous basis. And then the more science came in. And then the third assessment of IPCC also lead to uh, the issue of adaptation because in the beginning, the discussion was around mitigation and then adaptation became prominent through the third assessment report of IPCC. And then the whole issue of the two degree threshold came up from the IPCC fourth assessment report and the Paris Agreement and then the fifth assessment report of IPCC has been clearly instrumental to that. And the sixth assessment report is expecting to provide input to the global stock take. And then so that you can see the process. And while IPCC is not conducting research, it stimulates research because it assessing literature, peer review literature that came from the research. At the same time, non peer review literature also, because we have to bring in different perspectives, but there is some condition how to bring in and then all kind of knowledge. It's important to uh, understand that since the IPCC has been set up, it stimulated an exponential production of knowledge related to a better understanding of the climate uh, system, the climate issues in connection to the sustainability because all has been done in the, connect, in the, uh, the sustainable development context. Uh, that is the extreme activities. Recently, we had been asked uh, before, just after the Paris Convention, the IPCC to undertake a report on 1.5. We were a bit scared. We said that, oh, how can we do that? Is it possible? Do we have enough literature to assess? Because our uh, duty is to assess literature. And we assess within a very limited amount of time, two years term, 6,000 publication on the issue. In the beginning of the IPCC, globally we had around 10,000 publications, scientific publication on different aspects. Actually, some people are thinking about something between 300,000 to 500,000 publication. And then this is very important. That's how it has stimulated the, the research on various aspects. And if we look at also the composition of the IPCC, it was dominated by the scientists and then the institution coming from the North. Actually, all part of the world, including Africa, Latin America, Asia, are part of the process, it's an open process. It is not also a closed a group. That's very important. And it's also at the interlinkage between the policy and science, because it's not a research for research, it's to research how to inform science, at, how to inform policy at various levels. And then that seemed to me very important. It's very important also that in each of the assessment of IPCC report, it indicate the knowledge gap what do we know, what we don't know, and then how to bring those different elements. Maybe it might be important then to see how it will, on the extreme activities, where the research has to be done, and then to see what kind of infrastructure is needed, and then to bring that. And then also on the downstream activities. One of the important elements also of IPCC to make it more transparent, to make it highly policy relevant, is that it's based on the work of thousands of scientists who do it on a voluntary basis. They are not paid to do this. And it's important also to understand that and then to bring a sustainability element and aspect on it, the concept is co-conceived. And then all the work of IPCC is co-conceived with the government, with the policy makers, different stakeholders. And then that means the scoping of the, each of the report 
is done jointly with government and the other stakeholder. And then to agree on the outline of things that need to be done. And then in the report of the IPCC, particularly this uh, summary for policy makers is co-produced with the government because it's discussed line by line with the scientists and the government and then to have a better understanding. And then the report is at, in making that co-production, um, it's, it's back up with the underlying report rather than the pages because nothing can be part of the SPF that is not a main report. And then those are different elements. The co-consumption in the beginning defining the scope of the report and then the summary for the policymaker that has been conceived by the government. How you can see uh, how it has been defined and then that is clearly informing uh, the ambition of uh, this event that is uh, uh, the research and then how to bring in the sustainability uh, context. And then those are some of the elements I just want to bring to your attention in order to stimulate the discussion. I can go to some of the details in a Q&A question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuba. Uh, fantastic opening remarks from our panelists. I'd like to get into a little bit of Q&A. The first one um, is going to be directed to you, Edith, and then follow up from, from Yuba and Jan. But, you know, you, you've lived uh, through uh, the pandemic in terms of trying to harness um, sort of the science capacity to, to tackle things like vaccines. Um, and it re just reminds us that, you know, global challenges and crises do not respect national borders. The question is, how do we ensure that whether it's national or jointly funded research and research infrastructure is brought to bear, is brought online to address these global challenges? And maybe you can give us a little bit more insight into how you, in, it's in a very nimble way, were able to shift emphasis within um, some of your uh, infrastructure, some of your research programs to really target at something that had a lot of immediate urgency around the pandemic. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for that question. I think indeed it's very um, timely. I think for me, the first point that needs to be made here is that we absolutely need to ensure that um, scientific research and research infrastructures are properly funded and supported on an ongoing basis and not just activated in times of crisis. You know, our, our COVID-19 data portal, which was the basis of the European uh, COVID-19 platform, was something that we had already established for other purposes. And it's because we had the support to do that um, in a sustainable way that we were able to immediately transform it and activate it. Even in January, 2019, we were ready to go. And I think this, this really highlights how, if we hadn't had that, um, we would have been in a very difficult position because we need this sharing of data. We needed the open science aspect of it. We needed the bioinformatics, you know, the, now we have genomics, we can really follow what's happening with these viruses and, and also the, you know, how people are affected. If we didn't have that, we would have been, I would say, you know, almost in the middle ages, just watching it as it happened, not really understanding what's going on. That requires believing in investment before the time comes to activate. And I really think that this is what we should be thinking about across the board. And for example, in our new program, we want, we want to ask for support to, for example, have mobile labs so that we can really combine our research and services and take the laboratories where they're needed. You know, if the next challenge is gonna be of a slightly different nature, we need to go out in the field perhaps to, to actually address this. But for that, we need this, this sustained um, support in order to do it. And some of the tools that Emble developed um, 30 years ago are now being used against you know, this particular pandemic. The, the, the cryo-EM uh, sort of approaches that people are using to design where, you know, the vaccine should be uh, uh, targeted. Um, the vaccines themselves are being actually tested on some of our synchrotrons. If we hadn't had all that up and running, we never would have been able to react in the way we did. And although everyone's complaining about how slow everything is, actually, frankly, it's amazing that we have vaccines that work in such a short time. And that's because of the past investments into infrastructures and research. Thank you, Eva. So over to, to you, uh, Yuba, maybe carrying on in that thought from a policy perspective, and, and you know, climate change is clearly uh, an issue, a global challenge that's in front of us. 
perhaps is not seen, I won't say it isn't, but it's not seen perhaps as having the same level of, of urgency with respect to a pandemic, but nonetheless, the importance of really enabling and um, bringing to bear research and refer research infrastructure to tackle things like climate change. Could you maybe speak uh, from your experience at IPPC, IPCC, how that can be done to tackle something like climate change? I think that Edith indicated one key element that is the funding. And this is a critical, a crucial problem. And then being climate change or pandemic, and then this is an important issue for, for Africa. And I had experience on that because I was the uh, inaugural director of the African Climate Policy Center. And then to, do, uh, to uh, put in place a research infrastructure on uh, to inform policies in climate, one of the biggest problems is related to uh, how to get finance. And that also in the IPCC is a critical element because we do have limited scientists from Africa in the IPCC because they are not receiving any support from the government. And then there is a limited resources to put on uh, research. To a certain extent, this is understandable because uh, governments are confronted with uh, multiple uh, emergencies. Everything is urgent. Everything is urgent, and then they feel that investing in research is not so the payback of uh, investing in research is too long, and then they cannot wait. They have to look at the emergencies. And then this is uh, one of the biggest uh, problem dilemma we are facing. And at the same time, and then we have to find the ways, ways of uh, being part of number of network and then to bring some of the perspectives, some of the issues that are very important because uh, as it has been stated in uh, the uh, concept note, of this event, and then that is no single country can provide a solution to the problem. And then we have to do it collectively. This is a collective effort. And then we need in that perspective, and then to think about one important element that is emerging in the discussion, that is solidarity. It is not a cooperation. It is not uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, to give charity because we are in the same boat. And then we have to move together. And then we have to think together. We have to act together. We cannot act partially. And then that, that is related to climate related to the pandemic. You cannot isolate Europe or isolate North America or isolate Africa to deal with that issue. We may, to a certain limited number of, of, of time, deal with the problem in one part of the world. We cannot globally solve the problem. All the emerging global issues are collective, and then we need really to think through what the real meaning of solidarity, and then how to make it practical, and then how to go beyond, you know, the kind of classical way of dealing a relationship between countries, relationship between North and South, and then to take collectively our common challenges, and then to find best solution for the future of humanity. Thank you. Jan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, yes. Th thank you, Elizabeth. I mean, I, I resonate, resonate largely with, with the both, both panelists and uh, somehow proudly I can say that uh, ESFRI uh, develops already uh, 20 years in a very similar spirit. So, so the idea I have been mentioning in the beginning, namely this integrated a healthy ecosystem of research infrastructures, which uh, in some extent builds on the capacity of individual research infrastructures, but integrates that, interconnects that in many directions and uh, prepares. So, so, so we are somehow uh, developing a, a, a state of readiness which allows us to fast react on uh, upcoming uh, emergencies. And uh, the COVID situation has shown that research infrastructures indeed have a huge capacity. And, and since very early beginnings of the pandemics, we saw a huge mobilization of uh, research infrastructure resources. And uh, those have 
uh, not being uh, concerned only in life sciences, but actions were taken across all scientific disciplines and this interconnected network of research infrastructures, the research infrastructure clusters, their existence allowed really fast reactions and, and uh, there were mechanisms in place almost immediately last, like uh, fast tracks access pathways to research infrastructures, like uh, development of, of mechanisms to, to, to share specific data on COVID or, or other, other, other measures taken in, in uh, physical sciences or humanities that helped uh, developing technologies to battle COVID. So, so, so this is an example which shows that we really need this system uh, which spreads all over scientific disciplines because probably the next crisis will not be a, 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 a virus crisis. It eventually will even not be an environmental crisis. It may come from entirely dire different direction and we have to be equipped to react fast and a very broad scale. So, so the coordination we are doing, the strategic planning we are doing in ESFRI, the policy discussions we are doing among the, the member states, the European Commission, the involvement of stakeholders, the involvement of research infrastructure in those discussions seems to be very critical to increase our resilience. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Yuba, I'm gonna ask you to for the next question. And Really, it's about society's confidence in science. And, you know, for all of these global challenges, those that we've seen, those that are to come, as, as Jan has indicated, it's very important that society um, is comfortable and confident in, in the science and scientists. And we've seen that in the pandemic of the critical role it plays. How do we ensure that science is promoted and supported um, to get funding? Uh, to, to believe in the impact of science to solve some of this beyond a time of crisis. So the, the concept of science promotion, I think many scientists um, aren't necessarily so comfortable with promotion, but it's absolutely key to have that um, support from our community and most crucially, the support from funders. This has been one of the critical issues for the 30 years of the existence of the climate convention we're fighting for. And you see different mechanisms related to climate funding at the, uh, uh, from the global environmental facility to the specific fund of climate on adaptation on LDC fund on uh, uh, now the uh, uh, Global uh, Climate Fund, the GCF. But none of those funding is addressing research. That's the, that the big problem. And then they only focus on uh, actions, on activities. Natural research is conceived as one of the critical fundamental aspects because we all know, unless we have clarity on the science, action cannot be achieve the ultimate objective for which we will we'll be taking them. I remember back to the early days of the Climate Change Convention, when uh, the GF started, uh, they want to have a number of programs in, in Africa. I said, no, you cannot have a project on climate mitigation. You need to build capacity first. And the capacity is based on the science on the research. And we said that we need to start building, mobilizing capacity first and build the capacity in order to better understand and then to come up with how you articulate the development need of the country with the climate aspect. And then unless you have a good research, knowledge-based system, you cannot do that. And then, and then I said that the capacity issue, it is not one of projects for one, two years. It's an ongoing activities because it's a learning by doing. And then they started and then immediately, and then they stopped. One of the first projects in Africa on climate, I was conducting it, that was capacity building. And then to take different universities in four African countries, they stopped and then they changed it, they said enabling activity. That means everything, that means nothing. You run a workshop, it's enabling activity. It's completely different. 
for the and then if you look at the portfolio actually of the GCF or any bilateral, you will hardly hardly say anything related to the science, the production of the knowledge. And then all of them, they know that we are lacking. Uh, there is a huge knowledge gap on number of issues. And then that also emerged with the whole issue of the uh, pandemic. And then they look at, we look at the society in the North, what are the role, the confinement, the distances, the social distancing and all that. That will not work in Africa. Even if you take India, it can work in New Delhi. The, 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 the nice part of Delhi, the old Delhi will never work because of how people are the interconnection, the social issue, and we need to understand that. And then how you can edict rules if you do not understand the different aspects. And then those are some of the things we really need to have a play on the, at the global and bilateral level and then to support science and research in order to better inform policies. Thank you. Edith, uh, you're living and breathing this every day. Could you maybe give us your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think from, I, I completely agree with what you both said. Um, I think for us, what's obvious is that we, we have to make sure that science becomes a priority for society at large. And for that, you know, national governments, if they, if they know that, they will make sure it's, you know, it's properly funded. So it's this, you know, this knowledge-based world that we would all like to strive for. It's up to us as citizens. And as scientists, I feel we don't always do the best job in, you know, presenting what we do, our research uh, and its importance in a way that's comprehensible. We need to make, you know, obviously politicians aware, but we need everyone to be aware and to care. So it really is a dialogue that we need to invest in. And it's, it's not just about the journalists either. You know, obviously journalists are there to sort of uh, uh, transmit information, but it's up to us, all of us, to try and make sure that this will work. And I think this is, you know, the virtuous circle that at Ember we're trying to complete. And I want to give you one example of something that really worked. So Embel um, has collaborated with this research vessel, this boat called Tara. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tara Oceans. It was a wonderful project where it's a tiny little uh, sailing boat went around the world to sample the world's oceans, to look at biodiversity in a very kind of um, systematic way. And we were actually part of it right from the beginning. And last year or a couple of years ago, we did a microplastics tour in 2019 with them. And every time the boat stopped off, it would spend the morning hosting school kids, teachers, showing what science is about. And it was systematic. It wasn't, oh, well, today we're going to do it. Every day, whenever they were in port, that's what they would do. And in a way, I think that's what we should all do. And we really have to make the effort. It's not easy to sort of get away from, you know, what our particular mission is, molecular biology, running a synchrotron, whatever, we've got to reach out to citizens. So I think citizen science and reaching out to society is going to be key if we want to change things. And we have to change fast. As I think, Elizabeth, you said, you know, climate change is creeping up on us. We don't see it, what is happening. And unless people become aware and we help them realize that there are solutions, you know, with science, we can find solutions before it's too late. Look at acid rain, you know, look at the ozone hole. So we need to do this in a very, very proactive way. And we have the tools now, you know, things like internet, we really can communicate across the world. And I think that for me is where um, Embel is trying to act, to try and connect up to society in the most proactive way we, we can. Great. Uh, Jan, maybe you could respond and also bridge into our, our next question, which is really, uh, you know, going back to where we started, we can't do this alone. Um, it is about promoting science, about doing science um, and taking an international approach. And, and if you could maybe speak to that, you know, the benefits of international, I know you're working within Europe and then Europe is connected to the broader world. So if you could uh, give us your thoughts, please. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, first, uh, let me just narrow down uh, the, the, the previous question to the perspective of research infrastructures, because I think there is a, a very important element to be mentioned, namely uh, research infrastructures and their distinct strengths is that 
those research infrastructures are natural meeting points, are meeting points where diverse scientific communities jointly develop and understand uh, scientific issues, verify scientific theories. These are meeting points where basic science is challenging technologies and, and technical development. There are meeting, these are meeting points where scientific discoveries are transformed into innovations. These are meeting points where transversal communication creates new cultural dialogue platforms, networking opportunities, including communication with the society. Uh, the capacity to, to respond to these complex issues as we are, are speaking about them, being it a COVID pandemic or, or uh, issues related to environment, I don't know, earthquake, ozone holes and so on, uh, require uh, that this communication takes place at a very broad scale because it uh, requires not only uh, transdisciplinary communication among the scientists, that gives impetus to novel ideas and, and uh, probably also fertilizes the environment to develop science-based solutions to these societal needs and challenges. But it also needs the communication with the, with the society to, to increase the acceptance, to increase the pressure for solving these issues because it costs money. And, and uh, I mean, it's public money after all. And, and uh, so, so the, polit uh, the, the decisions are taken at the policy political level and, and a, a social understanding, social support, social pressure even helps a lot to, to bring these, these important issues to the horizon. And I think research infrastructures have also here a, a role to play. And uh, to, the, to the international cooperation, I mean, uh, surely uh, we are in a situation where we in Europe, uh, build with S3 and with other initiatives, with, with, with the ERICS regulation and so on, we built in to the research infrastructures already a piece of international environment, being it only the, the European one. And, and now, the last years, we, we are trying to extend and, and uh, let the infrastructures operate in open modes, internationally or even globally to network with partners in other parts of the world to, to create mechanisms for, for funding and, and supporting access to European uh, infrastructures, to develop schemes, how to be better align, how to make, make uh, the services of research infrastructures globally more efficient, effective, in a synergic manner. Uh, yes, uh, this is true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are still in, in very early beginnings because all this endeavor uh, must be projected to, to some uh, governance models. And, and again, we are, we are here with funding, we are here with, 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 with sharing, sharing the cost, sharing responsibilities, sharing the workload, sharing all, all these issues. And, and there, uh, the models are really just being developed. So, so to extend the, 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 the open science concept, the data sharing uh, uh, concept, the, 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 the concept of open access to research infrastructures globally will still require some, some work, but I, I, I believe that we already understand the problem and so we are moving closer to a solution. Thank you. I just I wanted to continue on the vein of, of international cooperation and I'm going to turn it to you, Yuba, but, but from a slightly different lens and, and that is from the disparity in access and availability of research infrastructure, state-of-the-art infrastructure between developing and developed countries. Um, what do you think can be done to help address this particular issue um, and, and building that international cooperation and more equitable access to state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure? I, I think that uh, we already do have experience on that that work very well, but that will really require, as I indicated, and then to have a clear understanding of what solidarity means, and then to also have a minimum of humility. 
back to the 80s, after the second oil shock, the European Union decided and then to think energy policy for Europe, how to be uh, dependent and dependent from the oil importing. And there were some like-minded people at that time at the European Commission. And then they said, oh, for us, in order to think how Europe can be independent, how Europe can articulate its energy policy, we have to have developing countries articulate their own energy policy in their own perspective. And they decided to set up, we set up a network called Cooperative Program on Energy and Development with different universities and think tanks from the South and the think tank universities in the North, in Europe. It was University of Cope in Rio de Janeiro, UNAM University in Mexico, Bariloche Foundation in Argentina, Terry in India, INET in China, ENDA in Senegal, in Africa, University of Dar es Salaam, with SPRU in Brighton and EAG in Grenoble. Each year we define what we think are the most important issue independently. It is not the think tank, the University of the North who will think through. And then we look at the same issue differently from our own perspective. The European institution will look at the European perspective, the African, the African perspective, the Latin American, Latin American perspective, the Asian, the Asian American perspective, and then we put that together. And then from five years, we come up with training thousands of people on energy planning in Africa. And then the first energy balance of Africa has been set up through that process. And then the training also for energy policy and energy planning. And then we even connect with the World Bank to have the energy policy training course for Africa. And then those kind of things we need to uh, stimulate them and then to bring them. We do have experience on that, dealing with the common problem, the common issues. And then we all need to set the agenda of what the research need to be done. We all need to conduct jointly, collectively, from our own perspectives. And then the way you define the energy transition in Europe and the way you define the energy transition in Africa completely different. If I have to take, I have not seen currently in any of the discussion on energy transition phasing out charcoal and firewood in Africa by 2030. And this is fundamental critical health issue, fundamental critical climate issue, fundamental critical development issue. And this is one of the key elements that should be at the back, uh, the, uh, at the heart of the energy transition in Africa. And then those will never transpire if some will think for the African. And then, but the, the point is that, that means to have the solidarity and then to bring resources, we cannot ask also the African government that are dealing with thousands of emergencies and then to put some resources on the research side. Thank you. I hope that uh, is helpful. Edith, thank you. Uh, Edith, over to you. Um, in terms of maybe examples of international collaboration beyond Europe or with developing countries, could you yeah. perhaps uh, highlight some work that uh, you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say, first of all, that, you know, I think we should, as scientists um, working with research infrastructures, science should have no frontiers and science should be global. And today we really can be global. So for example, from EMBL's perspective, the infrastructures and the uh, technologies that we have, we want to be able to share. So this idea of having mobile labs where we take the infrastructure to the country that needs it is very much part of that philosophy. Things are becoming easier and easier, cheaper and cheaper. And we need to share with all the world, the tools that we have, whether it's you know going out and sequencing the genomes wherever you are, it's, it's becoming much easier. So this is something I feel very passionate about. And actually I'm in the scientific council of the World Health Organization. And this is exactly the sort of thing that we're talking about. How could we do this in a global way? Now to come back to the question of, so, you know, Yuba, you're perfectly right. You know, Europe finds its solutions. Well, I think that Europe has, done not too badly, Horizon 2020 was a wonderful widening program with its um, twinning and teaming actions that allowed some of the member states who actually really didn't have the access that, that they could. Um, and they used these, these um, tools 
to actually build up um, strengths. And, and we've seen this even in a few years, how quickly a country can sort of take off because of these twinning and teamings between different countries. And this is what we need to do to other parts of the world. And at EMBL, we're part of, for example, a consortium called Cabana, which together with nine um, Latin American organizations has the goal to strengthen bioinformatics capacity across Latin America through open data sharing. So the, the Cabana project actually aims to tackle three global challenges. One is communicable disease, the other is sustainable food production, and the third is protection of biodiversity. So this is something that we can do now easily with Latin America. And this is, I think, what we should try to do across the world. Um, and I do look forward to being able to work with all continents uh, because I truly believe that science should have no frontiers. Thank you. Uh, Jan, over to you for a final comment before we open it up to questions from our participants. Thank you. I, I will be very brief because I essentially agree with that what, what uh, was said by, by Edith and just uh, slightly extending on that and trying to make a bridge back to the, the point where the discussion started. Of course, we have many initiatives which try to uh, involve and engage with scientists from all over the world. We, we are arguing that uh, uh, science has no frontiers, that uh, best, best uh, let's say, research shall find a place and a best research project shall be supported respectively uh, from, from the region they come from. But on the other hand, research infrastructures as physical installations have, of course, also the regional dimension and, and they, have, they have impact in a very small perimeter uh, where, uh, where they are placed. So one has to ensure a balance between scientific excellence we are speaking about and the territorial cohesion. This is now done throughout uh, Europe. We are using European regional development funds uh, to, to build research infrastructures in less performing regions. And this seems to be a big, big success, in particular because uh, the access to, to research in infrastructures is now possible also in a, in a remote way. We are also trying to extend this, this concept globally and some of the research infrastructures, some of the European research infrastructures are built in uh, remote areas, SKA in, in South Africa, in Australia, uh, the, the, the telescopes in Chile and so on. But uh, again, this concept requires a lot of uh, policy reconsiderations, but it seems to, to work and, and we shall definitely extend on that. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you to our panelists for the first part of the Q&A, and uh, we're going to move to Q&A from our participants. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, on to the next section.